Turn to Psalms 24 tonight, and we're going to pick up with part B of what we started um, last week on level two, exposing the darkness, sounding the alarm on the alien deception. And uh, we want to begin tonight by just reading Psalms uh, 24, and I'm going to start with just verse 7. And Alan, I do have a PowerPoint in there. I'll holler at you in a minute to put that up there. Thank you, sir. But it says, lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and let the sovereign of esteem, or the king of glory, come in. Who is this king of glory? Jehovah, strong and mighty. Jehovah, mighty in battle. Everybody say, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift up, you everlasting doors, and let the king of glory or the sovereign of esteem come in. Who is this king of glory? Jehovah of hosts. He is the sovereign of esteem. You know, in verse 9, it says, who is this king of glory? And it says, Jehovah of hosts. In this translation, Lord of hosts and King James NIV says Lord Almighty, so you lose a little bit of it there if you don't understand what Almighty means. But the New Living Translation does a great translation on this. It says that the, the Jehovah or the Lord of, the, of heaven's armies. And you know, I was thinking about that today. Why does heaven need an army? Have you ever thought about that? Why does heaven need an army? It's not because God isn't capable of just taking care of things. But we are in the middle of an angelic rebellion. And he is the Jehovah of the host of the holy ones against the rebellious ones. And we know who's going to win, but we live on a planet where that's being acted out, seen and unseen. And he is the Lord of hosts. He is the Jehovah of the armies of heaven. That's who he is. Amen. So we're going to turn tonight and look at Genesis 6. And we're just going to continue to look in a little bit back into that. But I just want to pray. Father, I just, I bind um, the non-responsive spirit out of this place tonight in the name of Yeshua. And Father, I just come against any spirits that would be aggravated that this is being revealed and uh, exclaimed tonight. And I just speak shalom, peace, acceptance, and love, and victory into this atmosphere tonight. And Father, I just thank you that there's no competition. There's no pitting one against the other. And I just command the hissing in the atmosphere to shut up. In the name of Yeshua, shut up. I take authority over you, and I tell you right now, shut up. And I just release the voice of God and the peace of heaven into this place. And Father, I come against that animosity and the, the enemy's trying to, to aggravate in the atmosphere, and I just tell you to cease and desist in your operations. And Father, now I just release a hunger and a thirst. Father, I take off weariness. I take off um, complacency. I take off apathy. Father, and I just release a hunger and a, and a desire to pull on the glory, pull on the word, pull on what you have for us in this place tonight. And I thank you for it. Let's just stand to your feet for a minute, if you would. I just want you to pray in the spirit for just a minute. I'm not going to pull this by myself tonight, so come on and hook up. <laughs> Just stir up your hunger. Just stir up your hunger. God wants to impart tonight. He wants to impart. Yeah, thank you, God. Thank you, Papa. Amen, amen. That's pretty good for Wednesday night. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, we are looking at Genesis chapter 6, and we're going to continue to look at um, the Nephilim tonight. At the, we're going to get into the sons of God and a little bit more understanding of what that is. But I want to review a couple of premises that we discussed last week in the Wednesday night session. Now, this is separate from the first day session, okay? First day session, we were doing a little bit of disclosure more on the alien line. This is more the biblical line of some of the background of that. 
And if Holy Spirit leads this coming first day, um, we're going to be talking about some New Testament revelation about this alien deception, um, posing alien deception. There's really not an alien, but we're using that title. But here's two premises I need to be sure we're all on the same page as we pick up here tonight. Is number one, there are and never will be real Star Wars aliens. What there is and what we need to be mindful of is there are demons posing as something they are not. How many of you ever heard of ghosts? All right? Ghosts are not ghosts. They're not just like missing spirits just floating around the earth of people that died. They are demons. Familiar spirits, psychics, and people like that that call up people from the dead. They are demons. And we're going to talk about that maybe in another series, but that's what they are. Ascended masters, which are really fallen angels, are are fallen angels, okay? Aliens are fallen angels. So they're uh, masquerading as images of light, as things that they are not, is the way they're coming across to us, all right? Number two, God has only created two types of species with intelligence. Turn to your neighbor tonight and say she's talking about you. <laughs> you have intelligence tonight, okay? Amen. The first one is heavenly beings. And we can look in 1 Corinthians 15 and tell there are two types of flesh in the earth. There's terrestrial, which is earth. We're made of dirt. We can find that in Genesis. And then there is celestial. Angels have celestial bodies. Their bodies are different from ours. And I, I said last week these are called heavenly beings, not just angels, because there are more than just angels, because angels means messenger. And Gabriel is an awesome messenger, but there's also cherubim, there's seraphim, there's living creatures, there's a whole host of things besides just messengers. So we need to understand that. Um, so God has created two types of beings with intelligence. One is heavenly beings. Two is Adam or mankind. Adam is multiplied into mankind. And he has a terrestrial or an earthly body. And again, we see that in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, there is a subclass of beings called demons that we will discuss a little bit later, okay? But we want to uh, talk about these other two for just a moment. If you ever encounter an intelligent being, you can assume from a biblical worldview that he or she is one of the following. They are either human, righteous, or unrighteous, or they are a heavenly being, holy, or fallen. That is all our scripture talks about other than the subclass that we're going to get into tonight. Now, we, we also looked last week that these uh, fallen angels, holy or fallen, have the ability to shape shift. They can appear in a heavenly form or in a human form. And we know that simply by reading some stories and some scriptures in those scriptures that say Hebrews chapter 13 verse 2, uh, that we entertain angels unaware because they can look like us. And we probably all have our angel sermons and stories and testimonies that we have of where we have seen and related to angels and then later realized it. The second great story to think about is Genesis 8, uh, 18, where um, Abraham's sitting in his tent flap and he looks up and there's these three men standing in front of him. One of them turns out to be uh, what they call a theophany, which is Yeshua, Jesus, in flesh in the Old Testament. And then two others appear as angels. And they have this dialogue, and uh, uh, Sarah's snickering in her tent, cause they're saying she's going to have a baby, and she's, you know, the ancient of days. And, and then, you know, they go, the whole intercession thing for Sodom and Gomorrah, which is a huge thing for our day to understand. And then you have the two angels that go to Sodom and Gomorrah, and uh, we may talk about that when we get to Jude, but they can look like people. Now, that's interesting when you think about the world scene and where we live. And you have to just ask the question, could there be people in places of significance and power that look like people? And could they be something other than people if they can look like people? That's just a good question. Don't necessarily have an answer tonight. We're looking at the second instance where a non-human intelligent species had contact with mankind in our Bibles. And so what we're going to do tonight is read Genesis, and we're going to read um, chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. So let's just read. And it came to be, when men began to increase on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of Elohim, or the sons of God, saw the daughters of men, that they were good. And they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. It doesn't act, sound like they had much choice in that situation. Verse 3, and Jehovah said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever in his going astray. 
He is flesh, and his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim, or the King James says giants, if you look that up in the Hebrew, it is the Nephilim, were on the earth in those days and also afterward. When the sons of Elohim, and I want you to notice that phrase again, came in to the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old the men of name. And Jehovah saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. It's not that bad now, but this was bad, all right? It's getting bad, but it's not that bad. Verse 6, and Jehovah was sorry, all right? That word is nakam in the Hebrew. It's the same word when it says over in chapter 5 that Noah's name meant comfort. That's what his name means, that he was to comfort. And it means to have pity or compassion. So you could actually read that verse. And Jehovah had pity and had compassion and pity that he had made man on the earth. And he was grieved in his heart because of what was happening to them down here. In verse 7, And Jehovah said, I am going to wipe off man whom I have created from the face of the ground, both man and beast, creeping creature, and birds of the heavens. For I am sorry, and it's the same word in the Hebrew, I've had, I'm having compassion and pity that I have made them. But Noah found favor or grace in the eyes of Jehovah. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a righteous man Perfect in his generations. Noah walked with Elohim. And Noah brought forth three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the earth was corrupt before Elohim, and the earth was filled. Not just one location, not just the Middle East, but the earth. The earth. That's why they find giant skeleton bones all over the planet. Not just in the Middle East, because the Nephilim were not just in the Middle East. They were all over the planet. You find them in South America. You find them in Ohio Valley. You find them all over the place. Where you don't find them is in the um, museum in Washington, D.C. And the earth was corrupt before Elohim, and the earth was filled with violence. And Elohim looked upon the earth and saw that it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And that word all flesh there is not just human flesh when you look it up. They were messing with all flesh. One more verse. And Elohim said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And see, I am going to destroy them from the earth. Now, what we're going to do is look here at the sons of God and break that down and review just a little bit. But, um, you know, it's interesting when Joshua and the children of Israel were going into Canaan, it's one of the things that were said about the Nephilim that were found, the giants that were found in Canaan when they went in there, is that they, they devoured the inhabitants of the land. And, you know, I was listening to somebody the other day. I was doing some research on vampirism, and, uh, which is in your Bible, where it says the whore of Babylon is drunk on the blood of the saints in uh, Revelation 17. And so this new fad of paranormal stuff and, and vampirism. But they were talking about this thing, fee fi fo fum I smell the blood of an Englishman. You know that old thing and that old story back there. Well, one of the young girls that has gotten into vampirism said the problem is once you drink human blood, you can smell it. And they said when you get into that environment, and what we don't realize often is these Nephilim were truly devouring the inhabitants of the land. That's what the Bible said. I mean, that's why the grapes were so big. They had to grow something big enough to fill their bellies. And when, you know, when the, we're going to see in the book of Enoch that when the people couldn't bring enough food and sacrifices to satisfy them, they just ate the people. And this was going on all over the planet. But there was one man, perfect in his generations, and that doesn't mean he was like, it meant all his genealogy, his gene pool had not been messed with by the Nephilim. And what God was actually doing here was saving the gene pool of humanity for the Messiah to come. Because that's what the enemy was trying to do, was so mess up the gene pool, the DNA of humanity, that the Messiah could not be born from the seed of a woman. 
And so God had to come and just wipe the slate clean. And how many of you know God can only use one? He can just take one and get the job done. So he actually had eight. There was Noah and seven. And eight is also the number in the Bible for um, new beginnings, for the new millennium, for the kingdom. Um, there's, so there's a whole lot there. But go back up to verse 2. And this, you know, you need to realize verses 1 and 2 is one sentence. All right? It's a long sentence. But you need to know this. As I said last week, I used to think knowing this about chapter 6 was optional. But in Matthew 24, when Yeshua was given the briefing to his personal disciples on what the end would be like, he said it would be as in the days of Noah in Matthew 24. And when you don't understand how corrupt the earth was, how vile it was, how violated the earth, the species, the people were being, you think big, mean God up there killing people when what God was doing was rescuing man that he had made for them to come out. And when you read Jasser and some of the other accounts, you find out that there were righteous people on the earth besides Noah, but they actually died. They died before the flood came and God got them out that way. So there's some backstory and we won't go into all that tonight, but um, let's just look at one again. And I know these are unusual verses, but it says, and it came to be when man began to increase on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of Elohim, everybody say sons of Elohim. Now I realize mine says Elohim. Elohim is just the Hebrew word for God. Elohim means mighty one or strong one. El is the abbreviation, the strong L, the mighty L, E-L. And um, Elohim is just the word for God. Um, but what we need to understand is that angels are direct creations of Elohim. Angels are direct creations of Elohim. Now, the word here, sons of God, in the Hebrew is the phrase, benai ha Elohim. Benai he, I think, Elohim. And every time this phrase is used, benai ha Elohim, in the Old Testament, which is translated in our English version, son of God. Old Testament Every time this phrase is used, sons of God, it refers to angels. Every single time. Now, there's some, you know, theory that's taught in some seminaries. It's not as popular as it used to be because there's so much revelation coming out on this called the, the Sethite theory where these were uh, sons of Seth and they were marrying the daughters of Cain, and, you know, they were so good and so bad, they were having weird children, and I wish I could remember what um, Tom Horn says, is that if you have a sinner marry a saint, you don't care how ugly their children are, they're still not monsters, right? I think that's what he said. That was a good quote. But, um, you know, you don't have an unbeliever marry a believer, and they beget giants, you know, there was something more going on here. It's so unscriptural. There's no scriptures to support the Sethite theory whatsoever. All the ancient fathers, all the rabbis, the early church all believe this. So, um, but we've lost it for a time and we're getting it back. But we need to understand that other than Adam, the original Adam, no man is ever called a son of God before the resurrection of Yeshua. And as I was studying this, it just hit me so much just you know we know what we have we know who we are but it was just another revelation and wave of what god has done for us so uh, mr allen if you would put up that powerpoint for us tonight and i just want to give credit to um, minister dante fortson he has a book called as the days of noah were and he really helped put a lot of this together and i just have to give him credit for that but i want you to notice the first thing up here angels were each direct creations by god classifying them as sons of God, Benai Hai Elohim. Fallen angels are still sons of Elohim. They are just disobedient sons. Now, we said last week, in the Genesis account, man was given a counterpart. Man was given a woman, was given a wife, and they were given the command to do what? Increase, multiply, subdue, fill the earth, to procreate. We find no such command for angels in the Bible. And each one of them are individual, direct creations from God. Um, we know that they were here before we were here. If you go over to Job um, chapter 38. Job 38, 4 through 7 
says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. Who set its measurements if you knew or were stretched the line upon it? Upon what were its foundations sunk or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning star sang together and all the sons of Elohim shouted for joy. That phrase, sons of Elohim, is the same phrase, benai he Elohim. And that is a reference to the angels. Now, if Holy Spirit permits later on this year, we might do a study on the divine council. Because when you look at that and you look in the Old Testament, it just opens up so much more. And I'm just now starting to really look into some of that. But it's phenomenal But um, to understand. But we need to first understand that angels are called sons of God in the Old Testament. And they are direct creations. And even if they're fallen, that just means they're disobedient sons, all right? So go back to Genesis 6 now. The next thing we see is that Adam was a direct creation by God, making him a son. Now, flip back to one, one chapter, to Genesis chapter 5, and this really bears it out very clear. Genesis chapter 5, verse 1, it says, This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that Elohim created man, he made him in the likeness of Elohim. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and called their name Adam in the day they were created. And notice that they were created in the likeness of Elohim. Now notice verse 3. And Adam lived 130 years and brought forth a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. So you can see there that Seth was not a direct creation. There was a procreation, which we would understand, but that's a good verse if you ever have to, to demonstrate that to somebody to point that out. That's also another reason why Yeshua in the New Testament is called the second Adam because he himself is a direct creation. He's not called the 50 millionth man. He is the second Adam, and that's why. Now you get into this next thing um, on the PowerPoint is the conception of the Messiah was by God's hand making him the only begotten son of God or son of the Father. How many of you remember reading that in your Bibles? The only begotten son, all right? That's not a word we use a lot. But um, now the Messiah is unique in and of himself because he is 100% God. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was God. The word was with God, all right? So Jesus, Yeshua, is God, but he's also 100% man. I remember being in a seminary class one time. Mark was taking some seminary work, and so I thought I'd sign up and take a class. And I go and sit in there, and the guy's teaching how Jesus laid down all of his uh, godly... No, he did not lay down any of his godly attributes. And so all the work that he did in the earth, he did because he was God, not because he had the Holy Spirit. But that's why we can't heal and we can't, he was cessationist, you know. And I sat there for about maybe an hour and I just couldn't take it anymore. And so I finally raised my hand and said, what do you do with Philippians 2? Where he considered equality with God, nothing to be grasped, but laid it down, you know. And started rattling off some scriptures and I think I really irritated him. And I finally just felt sorry and got quiet. But this is sad because Jesus laid down his divinity and took on the servanthood nature and the form of a man. But he still retained his personhood of God, all right? But he laid down the attributes of God. Does that make sense? So he is a unique cre creation. But another unique thing about Jesus, our wonderful Messiah, is that he was begotten. Now, the word begotten simply means to be born, to be born. Now, I want to ask you this question. If Yeshua is the only begotten son, then that implies that God has other sons, that were not begotten or born. So angels were not begotten or born. Um, Adam was not begotten or born. They were what? Created, all right? And so we need to understand the difference. The scripture seems to make it clear that the title son is reserved for those directly created by God's hand in the old covenant. But now we come to our stance with Yeshua. Hallelujah. Believers become a new creation after we accept Jesus or Yeshua, making us sons and daughters via adoption. 
And, and, you know, it was just, as I said, as I was studying this, just so thanking Father again for what he has done for us. We are not born sons of God. We're born sons of man. But when we become a new creature in Christ, we become, by the spirit of adoption, an heir, a son. I mean, let's just marvel. Will you just marvel at some of these scriptures with me tonight? Turn to John. Let's go to the New Testament for a minute. Uh, this is one of Mark's favorite scriptures when I've been with him, when he's been witnessing to people. Um, because some people don't live like a son of God. They say a prayer, but their lives don't change. And I love to watch him because he loves to get this scripture and say, when you get born again, something should change in your life because you receive the power to be a son of God. It's not hard to read your Bible. It's not hard to worship. It's not hard to pray because there's an inward renewing. There's a Holy Spirit now living in you yearning to do those things. You may succeed and fail for a while, but you're miserable if you're not going after him. John chapter 1 verse 12, but as many as received Yeshua, Jesus, to them he gave the authority to become sons of Elohim, sons of God, to those believing in his name. Look at verse 14, and the word became flesh and pitched his tent among us, and we saw his glory, his esteem, as of an only brought forth of the Father, complete in favor of and in truth. Any sons of God in the house tonight, say hallelujah. hallelujah. Turn to Galatians chapter 4, and let's look at this. This is awesome. This, you could just reread some of these scriptures, and they just have this bam. It's like that cook just throws it in there. Bam. A little more bam tonight. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 says, but when the completion of the time came, Elohim sent forth his son, born of a woman, under the Torah. Now, if you look back up to verse 23, you'll find out what it means by under the Torah. In chapter 3, 23, it says, but before belief came or before faith came, we were being guarded under the Torah. You see, the law's not a bad thing. It was protecting us and guarding us until the Holy Spirit could come in there causing us to want to do the Torah. God hasn't changed his mind. You still don't murder. You still don't, you know, commit adultery. You still don't lie. You still don't do those things. All right? Yes. But before belief came, we were being guarded under Torah, having been shut up for the belief being about to be revealed. And that's what Yeshua brought to us. Now I'm back in chapter 4, verse 4. It says, but when the completion of the time came, Elohim, God, sent forth his son, born of a woman, there he is born again, born under Torah to redeem those who were under Torah in order to receive what? The adoption as sons. And because you are sons, Elohim has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying what? Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, you are also an heir. An heir of what? A Mercedes? That would be good. Heir of a big house? That would be good. Heir of a state? That would be good. How about a continent? That'd be great. How about a planet? That's good. But how about God? And how about his entire kingdom and all of his glory? So you were no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, also an heir of Elohim through Jesus, Yeshua, Messiah. But then indeed, not knowing Elohim, you serve those which by nature are not mighty ones. That's the little G's or the little Elohim's, and we'll look at that later. Go over to Romans 8. Romans 8, 14 through 17. It says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God or Elohim, these are sons of Elohim. You just need to ask people, do you hear his voice? You don't need to say, are you a Christian? That doesn't work in America. Everybody's a Christian. You know, they get up there and sing their devil songs, and they get up there, and I'd like to thank God for the opportunity, you know. You need to say, do you hear his voice? I mean, that's going to cut thin the crowd really good because they're going to think you're crazy, you know, when you do hear his voice. But that's all right. That's what makes us a son is we're led by his spirit. His voice leads us. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. 
The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of Elohim. And if children were heirs, truly heirs of God and co-heirs with Messiah, if indeed we suffer with him in order that we also may be exalted together. Amen? Turn to Hebrews. Are you getting happy? Hebrews chapter 2. This is what our God has done for us. Hebrews chapter 2, look at verse 10. For it was fitting for him, because of whom all are, and through whom all are, he's talking about Jesus here, Yeshua, in bringing many sons to glory or to esteem, to make the prince of their deliverance perfect through suffering. So we see here that Jesus has not only been born as a son of God, but he has brought many sons to what? Glory. Everybody say, glory is my destination. And say, glory is where I live. Verse 16. For doubtless, notice this. Now this is he, Jesus Yeshua does not take hold of messengers, but he does take hold of the seed of Abraham. Can you pop down to verse 16? I want to see how it reads in that. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Now, you need to meditate that on a minute because one of the lies that the enemy tells people when he's deceiving them is that um, God has done Satan wrong, that he kicked him out of heaven in a wrong way, and that there's hope for, for him still to be brought back to being a son of God. And one of the best scriptures to debunk that lie is the understanding from this verse that Jesus did not come to help angels. He came to help men. Angels have made their decision, and they're sealed in that. We are making our decision, and after death, we are sealed in that. But we need to understand Jesus did not come to help angels. He came to help men, all right? And this is another interesting one. Look at Luke, last one here, but we just, I had to read some of these tonight. Luke chapter 20, verse 36. Um, this is the story where the Sadducees, who were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection, and they came to Yeshua, and they were saying, they're trying to trip him up. They didn't even believe in resurrection, and they asked him a resurrection story. And they just said, okay, there's this man, he marries a wife, and then he dies, and then they don't have a child, and then, you know, they marry another brother, and then he dies, and then they go through seven brothers. And I don't know why they think they can stump God with this question. But then they get down to 34, chapter 20 of Luke, and it says, And Yeshua answering them said, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are counted worthy of attaining that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are they given in marriage. For neither, notice this, is it possible for them to die any more because they are like messengers or angels and are sons of Elohim being sons of the resurrection. Now, there's a lot of sons in there, isn't it? But what Yeshua is basically saying is that after the resurrection, we will be like the sons of God, which are who? The angels. We will be like them. And some people misconstrue this. We may look at the other example of this in Matthew later that angels, you know, cannot procreate. And that's not what this Bible says. The, the, the scripture says they don't marry. Didn't say they couldn't take on a physical form and procreate. It's illegal for them to do that. God did not create them to do that. We know from scripture they did that. And Jeannie, from a biological standpoint, I don't know who could explain that. But we know that they did that. And so we know here from this verse that it simply says... They don't marry. Okay? It didn't say that they couldn't have children. So that's an interesting little pie to slice up right there. All right. Let's go back over here to Genesis 6 and look a little bit at this uh, sons of Elohim. As we just saw, Benai, hey, Elohim. Well, actually, I'm going to take you back. Sorry about that. 
Um, what do we know about these sons? Let's look at some New Testament examples of when they talk about them, and then I want to read just some out of the book of Enoch tonight. Um, let's go to Second Peter first. Let's just start with verse 1. 2 Peter, verse 1. Chapter 2, sorry. Chapter 2, verse 1. But there also came to be false prophets among the people, as also among you there shall be false teachers who shall secretly bring in destructive heresies and deny the master who brought them bringing swift destruction on themselves. So here we knew the, the new uh, early church was dealing with false teachers and false prophets, false apostles that were bringing in false doctrines, and that still happens in the world today. That's what Satan uses to fight against the truth. And then verse 2, and many, if I say many, shall follow their destructive ways. I wish that word was not many. I wish sometimes it was written different, but it's not. It says, broad is the way that leads to destruction, narrow is the way that leads to life. Many are they, small are they. So don't be surprised in the last days if you're not standing with a huge group of people. Because <laughs> that's just what the Bible says. And many shall follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And I believe we're coming into that more and more in the day where we live in, where the way, it doesn't say some of the ways of truth. There's just one way of truth. Who is the truth? And that way that he laid out, the narrow path is going to be spoken of as evil. What is love is going to be called hate. If you tell somebody in love, if you live this particular lifestyle, if you sin and you practice this sin, you're not going to go to heaven. You're going to be called a hater. And they're going to call lovers haters and haters lovers. And it's going to be a small group of people that's going to stand. But his remnant will. In verse 3, And in greed with fabricated words, they shall use you for gain. From of old, their judgment does not linger, and their destruction does not slumber. Now, of old here, who's, the, who's he talking about? This, their judgment's been written a long time. Look at verse 4. For if Elohim God did not spare the messengers or the angels who sinned, but sent them to Tartarus, which is a, a section of um, Sheol, of hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness. Can you go to Home Depot tonight and get chains of darkness? That'd be an interesting thing. Just going there, I'd like some chains of darkness. That'd be a great witnessing tool. What is that? Well, haven't you read, Peter, that they bound these angels with chains of darkness? You know, and you could talk about that. But they bound them with chains of darkness to be kept for judgment. These angels have not been judged yet. Who are these angels? We're going to see in Enoch in a minute. These angels are the 200 angels, the fallen watchers that came from heaven on Mount Hermon years ago, descended on Mount Hermon and began taking wives, taking women, and began procreating their own race upon the earth illegally. And they got so bad, finally God had to send the flood because they not only did men, then they decided bestiality, then they started messing with the plant life, and they just corrupted everything God had made because they hate him. They'd fallen with Satan. And um, this, the, the New Testament here tells us their fate, that they are now uh, chained up, in chains of darkness to be kept for judgment. Now, that's important because there's a little nugget I may share tonight. If we get there, their judgment has not happened yet. They're being reserved for judgment, okay? And then just so it'll help us tonight, look at verse 5. And did not spare the world of old, but preserved Noah. So notice the context of him talking about these messengers here, these fallen uh, watchers. Preserve Noah, a proclaimer of righteousness, and seven others, bringing in the flood on the world of the wicked. Verse 6, and having reduced to ashes the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, condemned them to destruction, having made them an example to those who afterward would live wickedly, and rescued righteous Lot, who was oppressed with the indecent behavior of the lawless. So here you have destruction, preservation. Destruction, 
preservation. And you see that pattern. God is able to keep the evil and the wicked for the day of judgment, and he's able to preserve the righteous. Can you say hallelujah? All right? God is able to do that. But I want you to see, this is a great reference to write in Genesis chapter 6 by the sons of Elohim here, talking about a New Testament reference of these messengers, these angels who sinned, and, uh, and Jude tells us more of what they did. So let's turn over to Jude, which is another great New Testament reference. You need to write in Genesis 6 so you can refer to this. Um, Jude, one chapter, chapter 1. I'd like to read all this. I'm just, I think I may get into more of this on uh, first day. So let's just stick with this here. Let's just look at verse 6. Um, I have to do this tonight because Holy Spirit put this on my heart to share. So I'm going to do that. But uh, So let's just jump up. Go to 3. Beloved ones, making all haste to write to you concerning our common deliverance, I felt the necessity to write to you, urging you to earnestly contend for the belief or the faith. Everybody say the faith. The faith. Not many faiths, but the faith, the belief. Notice this, which was once for all delivered to the set-apart ones or to the saints. Now, it's once and for all been delivered. That means there's not going to be a 2.1, a 2.3. It's once and for all delivered. This gospel has been once and for all delivered. But then notice verse 4. See, this New Testament church, man, assemblies, they had this going on. For certain men have slipped in whose judgment was written about long ago, wicked ones perverting the grace or the favor of our God for indecency and denying the only master, Jehovah, and our master, Yeshua, Messiah. Now that word indecency there means in the Greek, lewdness without shame. Now I want you to think about that and what we're seeing happening in our world today where men have slipped in among us who say they're Christians and they are preaching that you can have the grace of God in your life and still sin and have no shame about your sin. And, you know, when I was studying this earlier today, the Holy Spirit reminded me of an article that I had read, uh, came across this week, and so I went ahead and found it and pulled it up to read you tonight. And I don't know if you guys know this or not, but this was from Huffington Post this week. And it says, Reverend Cameron Partridge will be first openly transgender priest to preach at the Washington National Cathedral. Have you guys heard that? I don't watch like major news, so I don't know if that's on major news. But this guy, his name is Reverend Dr. Cameron Partridge, will make history this coming Sunday, June 22nd, as the first openly transgender priest to preach at the historic Washington National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., in honor of Pride Month. I mean, you wonder why they take the, 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 the rainbow. I mean, the rainbow is what God used to cleanse the earth from what they did the first time. And so they're just like, in your face, in your face. Not these people that are victims, but I'm talking about the spirits that are using these people for their purposes. Most people that fall into homosexuality have been through trauma and sexual um, abuse early, and the enemy gets in and confuses them, and because they're confused, they're prey to this. But now we're having government and schools and everything teaching this and telling preachers, you better not preach about it, we'll put you in jail, you know, and all this kind of stuff um, that's coming out. But, you know, it, I just it's just amazing to me. God's had an altar call for pride two months ago, and they had pride month. And really, they're victims. I, 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 I'm not mad at homosexuals. I don't have an agenda against them. I pray for them to be delivered, to have the truth uh, brought to them, and for them not to be used because the enemy is using their souls and deceiving them. And here's a guy wearing a collar that's going to be preaching at the Washington Cathedral in Washington this Sunday. Um, the righteous Reverend Jeannie Robinson, known as the first openly gay priest to be elected a bishop, will preside at the service. 
Cameron pa Partridge is a priest of great intellect, pastoral presence, and possesses a deep passion for the gospel. We are excited for him to preach at the cathedral, said the very Reverend Gary Hall, the dean of Washington National Cathedral, in a statement sent to the Huffington Post. He said, as an advocate both within the church and wider community, Cameron's presence in the pulpit, I hope, will also send a symbolic message in support of greater equality for the transgender community. Partridge, I'm skipping, Partridge is one of the just seven openly trans clergy in the Episcopal Church. He became one of the first trans chaplains, I didn't know there was such a thing, at a major university when he was appointed Boston University's chaplain in 2011, according to religion and politics profile. In 2012, the Episcopal Church officially voted to change its non-discrimination canons to include gender identity and expression so that transgender people could not be barred from becoming priests under laws. And it goes on and says that. Father, I just pray tonight for Reverend Cameron Partridge. And Father, I just pray. Oh God, I don't really know how to pray. But Father, I just pray for mercy. I pray for mercy for him. I pray for mercy for our nation. And Father, I pray. I just... I. I come to you tonight, Father, this is my nation. Lord, we're responsible for our generation and our nation. And Father, this is happening on our watch. And Father, I just confess this as sin. Lord, it's sin. This, this man is deceived and this whole denomination is deceived. And, and Father, I just pray for them tonight, God, that you would just bring them the truth. Father, help as you're just continuing to work with the assembly of this place for a manifestation of your presence, for a manifestation of your power in this generation, Father, that we could display your glory in a greater way. I thank you for the deliverances that we're experiencing in this, in this uh, assembly right now. I thank you for the discipleship. I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for the healings. I thank you for everything that's going on. But, Father God, we just pray for a lavish outpouring of your presence upon us and on all the apostolic prophetic centers in this nation that are seeking you and seeking your glory. Father God, that the people of this nation that don't know who's God, Elohim or Baal, would see the true God and they would cry and fall on their face, there is a God. And Father, I pray for this priest. Father, I pray for him. God, that you would just reveal your love to him, reveal your truth to him. Set him free, Father God, and then use his voice as you did uh, the Apostle Paul who once murdered Christians to become a great apostle for you and to, to bring the truth, Father, because nothing is too hard for you. And God, we just ask in faith tonight Lord, for just a radical encounter with you, with Yeshua, in your presence, Father. And God, we just cry for mercy on our nation. And Lord, raise up ministers and pulpits that aren't afraid to preach the truth. And Father, help us to go out and live and not be afraid to preach the truth. Lord, there was just one Noah. But Lord, he stood and he built that ark. Help us to build an ark in our generation, Father. Help us to live righteously, God. Help us to live in the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Help us to raise our sons and daughters in the right rulings of Elohim. Father, we just thank you for that 